And I, I, I want to invite you all, uh, as you're at home, feel comfortable to say amen, hallelujah, uh, glory be to God. No one here will know any difference. No one is going to be there maybe besides your cat or your dog or your spouse to say, hey, that's enough of that. You're getting a little too out of control. Have fun today in the Lord. I want you to enjoy yourself this morning. And perhaps when we come back together, there'll be a bit of a, a change of our, our, our culture here. We'll be a bit more on fire for God. Amen. Uh, so, as you know, this is a, a pretty uh, stressful time for many. It's unusual. This is an unprecedented time in our, in our history. Um, but I, I find this time very prophetic. Uh, especially this last week, this last couple of weeks. Um, last week we heard from uh, our first interim uh, candidate, Pastor Matt. He, he spoke about uh, the shortage of toilet paper. He talked about how if you go into the, and I'm sure you know this, if you go into the supermarkets, you will not find toilet paper on the shelves. And I find that humorous because... It says to me that God is, he has a sense of humor, and he is in control. I want you to know that a couple of months ago, someone donated an abundance of toilet paper to the church. So if you are worried about running out of toilet paper, we got you. Just contact us, we'll get you some toilet paper. Amen? Um, I probably shouldn't have told the whole world that. But in any case, if you come looking for toilet paper, it'll be the best toilet paper because you're going to get the gospel with it. Amen? Um, and another prophetic uh, occurrence that kind of I saw this past week, uh, as you may know, I wasn't scheduled to preach today. Uh, Pastor Deborah, our second interim candidate, she was scheduled to teach or to preach or both. Um, but with all of this coronavirus and all of the uh, developing, um, everything developing, we all decided that it was probably best that she postpone. And, and so when she did, this was last week, I realized that I would have to preach and I hadn't planned anything. Uh, so I did what any pastor would do and I went to the lectionary. Uh, for, your, for those of you that don't know what the lectionary is, it's this a calendar, it's a three-year calendar that has a specific, specific verses ascribed for each day. And so the, the, the thought of it is, is that if the entire church, regardless of your denomination, if we're following the lectionary, we're all hearing the same verse being preached on every day of the week. And uh, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but there's sort of a, uh, a joke that's um, amongst pastors. If, uh, I've heard many stories where pastors will say, you know, I, I preached this sermon and uh, a parishioner came up to me afterwards and they say, you will never believe what happened. I, I was driving away in my car and I turned the radio on and somebody was preaching on the exact same verse that you were preaching on. What are the chances of that? And the path, they're always just, they just give a good laugh and yeah, you know, God, he works in mysterious ways. <laughs> but this is what they're doing. They're, 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 they're following the lectionary. So uh, in following the lectionary, uh, uh, I, know, I know Ken is going to have a good laugh at this because I talked to him about this and he says that I'm sort of giving my disclaimer, um, which may be some truth to that, but I, I really want to emphasize that I did not choose this passage. Um, if there was an issue in the church, any pastor, and this is nothing wrong with that, you could go and find the, a passage that is applicable, and you can preach on that passage. Uh, well, I can say that, well, God gave me this passage to preach on, and it speaks directly to our context just this past week and what's going on around us. So uh, I, I was very excited to really start digging into this. And so what we're talking about today, we're talking about uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13, as Ken just read. Um, and really, this is about Samuel anointing a new king of Israel. Uh, just to give you some background to catch you up to speed on what's going on, 
uh, Israel had come to Samuel complaining about his sons. He, they were saying that, you know, they don't follow the ways that you follow. And, you know, we, we want a king. We want a king like all of the other nations. And so Vex, Samuel, goes to God and God says, no, don't worry about it. You listen to them. Take heed to what they're saying. You give them exactly what they want. They are not rejecting you. They are rejecting me just as they have always done since I brought them out of Egypt. He says, no, listen to them. You give them exactly what they want. But you warn them, warn them sternly that this king, he will exact his due. He will take their sons, he will take his, their daughters, he will take the best of their lands, he will take his tithe. He will exact his due as king. And Samuel, he told this to Israel, and they were fine with it. They said, yes, that's fine. Uh, so God gave them the king that they wanted. God had Samuel anoint Saul, and this Saul was a very striking individual. He was very handsome, very, a very manly man. He was very tall, and he, it's written that he was a head taller than anyone else perhaps a, a foot or so, give or take, uh, taller than anyone else. And so this is what they wanted. They wanted someone that would fit the criteria of what they thought a king should be. They were looking for someone simply to idolize based upon his appearance. And so Saul, Samuel, he anointed Saul as king over Israel, and the Spirit of God was with him for a time, a short-lived time, uh, God had commanded that he go out and wipe out all of the Amalekites. And he said, don't spare anything. You destroy it all. And they disobeyed God, Saul and the army. They took spoils of war. They didn't uh, put to the sword the king of the Amalekites, Agag. And upon hearing this, um, God told Samuel this. He said that I have rejected Saul as king because he has disobeyed me. And so this story, this narrative, it picks up in chapter 16 with Samuel mourning Saul. He is mourning God's rejection of Saul. And God is saying to him, he says, how long will you mourn for this Saul? I have rejected him as king. It's not that Samuel was mourning Saul, that he was so sad for Saul. He understood what this meant. There would be a change of regime. Uh, and here in our society, in modern society, typically when there is a change of leadership, it's civil. In our elections, when one has lost power and Typically what one will do, they will call the, the, the winner, the loser will call the winner and say, okay, congratulations, I concede defeat. And this changing of power, is, is, it's civil, it's civilized, but not so in these times. What this meant, would, there would be probably bloodshed. If a change in this monarchy was to take place, it would be bloodshed. Perhaps Israel would be thrust into civil war. And so Saul, well, excuse me, Samuel, he is mourning the prospects of this nation being thrust into civil war. And God, but God says, how long will you mourn Samuel or Saul? I have rejected him as king. Go now to this family of Jesse and anoint. I will show you which one to anoint. I have chosen for myself a king. The NRSV and uh, several other uh, translations, they use this wording, God has chosen for himself a king. And this is a stark contrast between that and when he chose for Israel Saul. He gave Israel 
the king that they wanted. They were looking for someone to idolize. They were looking for someone that fit the criteria of what they thought a king should be. But here we see that God is saying, I have chosen for myself a king. Do we see that? I have chosen for myself a king. The book of Acts chapter 13 verse 22 tells us that David, he was a man after God's own heart and he was one that he would obey God's every command. God has chosen for himself a king. And Samuel, he, he, he replies to God. He's, he's saying, well, God, I can't, I, surely I can't go and anoint this king amongst the sons of Jesse. Uh, Saul, he'll catch word of it, and, and my head will be on a platter. And God says, he says, no, go take a heifer with you and go and sacrifice. Go and sacrifice an offering to me. And many scholars, they'll look at this and they'll say, well, this is a bit uh, dishonest. And then they'll try and justify this, that no, but it's, it's righteous because God is doing it for this reason. And I'll submit that that's a bunch of foolishness. Uh, who are we to decide and to discern what God says, what, what is righteous? Is God defines what is righteous. What God is doing here, it is, more, is highly more, more higher than the way of our thinking. We can't understand his ways. What he is doing, we don't have to justify. He is doing what he's doing because he's sovereign, and he can do whatever he wants to do, when he wants to do it, and how he wants to do it. Amen? And so he goes. Samuel, he goes to Bethlehem, and the people there are terrified. The, and uh, it would be assumed that the entire city was terrified because the elders came to uh, greet Samuel and they were trembling. And they asked him, do you come in peace? They were afraid, rightly so. The, the prophet of the Lord is uh, coming upon you, visiting your city. You would only imagine that there is a recompense to, 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 to deal with. And perhaps this is why God told Samuel to take an offering, to, to put them at ease. He says, no, I've, I come in peace. I come to sacrifice and to offer to the Lord. Go and sanctify yourselves. And he goes and he sanctifies Jesse and the sons. Sanctify yourselves, he says. This is a common theme when one is to consecrate themselves to the Lord. To set themselves apart for the Lord. We see in our times we are called to do this. We're called to sanctify ourselves, to, to make ourselves holy. We're called to be holy, to, to set time aside for God, to, 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 to be used by God. And I, I understand the the arguments, I understand the issues, you know, I, 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 I make them myself. You know, uh, I'm a pastor, I, I do ministry, I, I'm dealing with seminary, I'm, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a friend. There is always something to do. There is always something to deal with. We all have busy schedules, but you know, God has a way sometimes. He loves us so much he wants to spend time with us so much that sometimes when you have this busy schedule that, that you just can't find time for God, sometimes God will just say, well, why don't I just wipe out all of that and set you down for the next six to eight or however many weeks and just sit down and spend time with me? God has a way sometimes of just saying, you know what, why don't you sit down and we're going to spend some time together? If, if, if right now, when you're waking up, quarantine wherever you are, if you are not waking up in prayer, if you are not spending the day interceding for those that are sick, those that are hurting, those that are scared for this nation, for this world, if we are not going to bed in prayer, praying for those that are sick, I'm pretty sure that every last one of us, we know of someone that is sick right now that has possibly fallen ill to this virus. 
If we are not doing that, we are not taking advantage of the time that God has set aside for us to consecrate ourselves to the Lord. When we consecrate ourselves to the Lord, we are preparing to receive what God is about to say. God is about to move. He is doing his work, and we are to set ourselves aside and be prepared to hear what he has to say. Amen? And so we see and so that, we this, see offering that this offering took place. Took place. And, it, there's and it, there's probably two offerings here. Offerings most, here. Likely most likely this is, this is uh, uh, when they would when offer, they would offer do an offering. Do an offering. There would be, there the, would be meal the meal offering, where, offering they where they would consume the offering. The offering. And it's assumed, that, assumed that, only that only Jesse and Jesse his, and his uh, sons were invited to this. And what happens here, uh, it parallels with what happens with Israel when they chose a king. Samuel, he sees the first son come in, Eliab, and he says, Surely, this is the Lord's anointed. The, 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 the Lord's anointed is standing before him. And God, he quickly interjects. He says, no, do not look upon his stature. Do not look upon his, how, how he looks or what's the appearance of his all. Don't, don't pay attention to that. I have rejected him as king. I, I don't look at what you look at. I don't look at what's on the outside. I am looking at the heart of the individual. I, he says, I am looking at the heart of the individual. Last week, we had our first interim candidate, Pastor Matt, wonderful pastor. I really enjoyed his message. Wonderful. L love to just to 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 do ministry with this, this man. We had the opportunity after the service, after the sermon, to ask him questions, and we all sat around and got to know him a bit. And I, I'm pretty sure this is typical in any uh, church looking for a new pastor. You're going to interview them and, and to see uh, what qualities they have or what ideas they have. But as we were asking the questions, what I felt the Spirit telling me is, listen to what they're saying. They are, we're asking questions to see how this pastor fits in our idea, in our context, how we're going to fit him into our ministry, our vision. We're asking this pastor to find out how we could use this pastor based upon our vision, our thoughts, our ideas. And I had to speak up. I felt compelled to speak up and say, wait a minute. Uh, uh, God, whoever God puts here, he will use whoever. We don't have to figure out what attributes, what qualities they have in order to do ministry here because we don't have a vision. If we had a vision, we wouldn't be here in this situation in the first place. This is God's vision, and so we just adhere to who God puts in place. Amen? And so we see here that Samuel was about to make the same mistake that Israel made. He was looking on the outward appearance, what appeared to be applicable, what appeared to be what they could use as a king, what would be looked for in a king. But God is saying, no, I look for what is in the heart of the man or the individual. Amen? And so each and every one of his sons, the sons of Jesse, they, they pass by one at a time and and. and Nothing. Samuel says, no, it's none of these. None of these are the ones that God is wanting me to anoint. And so he asked uh, Jesse, Samuel asked Jesse, he says, is there not another? And he says, yeah, well, there's the youngest, David. He's out tending to the sheep. And Samuel says, he says, well, you go and you get him. Go and bring him right now. We shall not sit until he arrives. Do we see that? Typically with a, a, a shepherd, that, that's not a profession that anyone ascribes to be. No one 
grows up wanting to be a shepherd. Um, a lot of scholars will assume that David was, he perhaps at that point in time, he lacked intelligence because that's typically uh, the, 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 the type of individual that would take on this task. And so what we see here is one who was never invited to this offering, one who was never considered for this anointing, one who was not consecrated because no one even thought of him. He now becomes the premier set upon at the premier place at this sacrifice. They're saying, no, we will wait until this man arrives. We will not sit until he arrives. He is elevated to the, the, the guest of honor. And so as soon as uh, David comes in and they see David and, and, and Samuel, he sees him and God says, anoint him. This is the one I have chosen. He was very young. The, the, the author here, he remarks upon how good he looked and how uh, he looked young. But they were, what he's not saying, he's not saying that he's so handsome. He's saying that he was rather young. He was a child, but a child, still the youngest of them all. And so we see here, after Samuel anointed David, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him from that day forth. This is only written two other times in the Bible. The other was with Samson. It talks about the Spirit of the Lord coming upon one, typically in the book of Judges, in, in Judges. But only twice does it talk about the Spirit of the Lord coming mightily upon one. And we see when the Spirit of the Lord comes mightily upon one, when Samson, when the Spirit of the Lord was with Samson and he wiped out over a thousand men. We see that as the Spirit of the Lord came upon David immediately, in the previous chapters, the next chapters, the preceding chapters here, uh, somehow he's known for being this wonderful harpist. As Samuel, or Saul, I'm sorry, Saul was struck with this evil spirit. He had melancholy and he needed someone to calm him. And so they somehow David was known to, to be this wonderful harpist because the spirit of the Lord was mightily upon him. You know, uh, God was not looking for someone that fit the bill. He doesn't call necessarily those that are equipped to do the task at hand. He equips those to do the task before them. The Spirit of the Lord set him apart. We know that David become, after the Spirit of the Lord became, there was no other king in Israel that paralleled with David. The greatest king of Israel, not because of his attributes, not because of his statue, but because the Spirit of God was with him. When the Spirit of God is with you, you can be an ordinary person. You may not have any gifts, anything whatsoever, but when the Spirit of God is with you, you will do extraordinary things. When the Spirit of, the, of God is with you, you will do extraordinary things. Understand this. In the New Testament, when we look at Jesus, this though he was fully God, fully divine, he saw it fit to set aside his divinity. And so submitting himself to the Father, when the Spirit descended upon him, we see being empowered with the Spirit, we see what Christ was able to do. We see that this, this, this carpenter from Galilee, this backwoods country place, we see this man empowered with the Spirit. We see him begin to cast demons out. We see this carpenter from Galilee begin to feed the multitudes. We see the miracles performed when the Spirit of God is upon one. We see a carpenter who laid his life down and died for the forgiveness of our sins. 
because the Spirit of God was upon him and because he was obedient to God, because he was seeking after God's own heart, because he wanted to do and abide by God's every command. We see that when the Spirit of God is upon one, they will do extraordinary things. And Christ, he laid his life down and died so we could have forgiveness for our sins. That is what the Spirit of God can accomplish in one. Perhaps now you may feel the Spirit of God speaking to you. Perhaps you may say, well, you know, I haven't taken advantage of this time. I haven't been consecrating myself to God. It's been a long time since I've sought the Lord. Perhaps you feel the Spirit speaking to you right now. Perhaps the Spirit of God is upon you right now, beckoning you to come, to return to Him, to be that person after His own heart, to be that individual that is going to seek His every will, to seek His desire. Perhaps that is you. If that's you, if you feel the Spirit compelling you right now, won't you pray with us? Perhaps you've never, you, you have no idea what this is talking about. You have no idea what it means. But you feel, this, you feel something. You can't quite understand what it is. You don't quite know, but this is a feeling that you've never felt. And you feel this compulsion inside. You feel something beckoning you to surrender. You've tried it this way. You've tried it that way. Nothing seems to, to fall into place. There is a void in your life that you can't quite seem to, to fill up. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you right now. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Perhaps the Spirit of God is calling you. Calling you back to Himself. Only He can fill that void. If you feel that spirit, won't you, won't you be that individual after his own heart? Won't you be that one that will surrender to his every will? If that's you and you want to you wanna surrender, you want to submit, I want to pray with you. Won't you pray with us? Father, I'm a sinner. Without you, I'm lost. I don't know what I have to offer. I don't know what, what you would want from me anyway. I've done things that I don't even, I, 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 there, there's no way to start. I, I can't even, I, we'll be here all day. But Father, whatever I have in me, I want to give it to you. I want to surrender to you. I, I, I hear Christ. I hear him knocking at the door. I, I beg you, come in. Come in inside. Dine with me. I want to surrender to you. I want to be a child of God. I want to give my life to you. There's no other way. I don't know how. I just, I, I give it all to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.